January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I broke into a chamber beneath the Calvary Escarpment, north of the city wall of Jerusalem. In that chamber is the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and several other things that I didn't see. They were covered with animal skins, with boards, and then with stones. We found the cross hole. If you read in the book of Matthew and the Gospels where it talks about Christ's death, it says the earth shook violently and the rocks were rent. Right to the left of the cross hole, at the base of where Christ died on the cross, the rock was rent. After Christ died and the centurion stuck his spear into Christ's spleen and the blood and water came out, it went down through that crack. It went on to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that God had arranged to be hidden in that chamber 600 years before Christ died. The Ark of the Covenant is a secret gold-covered object known to the Jews, Christians, and also the Muslims. It has also been made known to a wider audience by being depicted in various movies. The oldest text written about it is the Torah found in the Jewish Tanakh and in the Old Testament of the Bible. It tells us about the Supreme God, the one who claimed to be the creator of planet Earth. He wrote ten laws on two tables of stone. These stones were then placed into a gold-covered chest. The chest itself was then closed with a seat or lid with two cherubims, one on each side of the lid. The ark was used for two different purposes. It was above this seat the creator of the earth would manifest himself as the law and the ark functioned as a throne for the creator. Secondly, it was put into a sanctuary system along with other holy objects. No one was allowed to enter the room that housed the ark, except once every year where a high priest brought blood into the room and placed the blood in front of the ark and on the seat of the ark. This signified how the people's transgressions against the law in the ark had been brought to justice by a substitute's blood being brought before the throne. It was later moved to the first temple in Jerusalem. Sometime before the Babylonians besieged the city and destroyed the temple, it is assumed that it was hidden or that it disappeared. A man by the name of Ronald Wyatt had started praying to God to use him to show the world that the Bible was true. Ron had already been looking into the flood story and investigated the possible remains of Noah's Ark. He was also studying the Israel exodus from Egypt and the location where they could have crossed the sea. Finding several old Egyptian chariot wheels. It was on one of the diving trips he ended up traveling by Jerusalem on his way home. He was walking along the cliff face with a new acquaintance when his hand suddenly went up on his own and his hand pointed to a place where some debris and trash was lying in front of the cliff. Without understanding why or how, he heard himself say, There is Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is there. He absolutely saw the possibility that the Ark could be hidden beneath, somewhere in these tunnel systems. He was convinced that God himself had inspired him to find it. Ronald started excavating with his two sons in the place where his hand had pointed. As they started excavating, he quickly found three niches in the cliff face. Ron thought that perhaps they could be niches that were meant to hold signs, coming from the Roman period. After all, Golgotha was close to the main road at the time of Jesus, and this could have been where Jesus was crucified. The well-known quote of Quintilian explains, 
Whenever we crucify criminals, very crowded highways are chosen so that many shall see it and may be moved by fear of it, because all punishment does not pertain so much to revenge as to example. Could these niches have been used to put signs in that revealed to the people the crimes the criminals had done? He started thinking that this side of the mountain could have been the place where people were crucified. This time they discovered that they could excavate down between the cliff and the rock and that the cliff almost formed a roof as they excavated downwards. He found a well-preserved section with a wall and a hewn stone standing horizontally out from the wall in the cliff face. A few feet in front of it, he noticed a square rock that didn't look like a natural shaped rock. He carefully picked it up and found a squarish hole chiseled into the bedrock underneath. Could this have been a cross hole? As he examined this hole and cleared away the dirt around it, he discovered that it had a large crack extending out from it. It appeared that the hole was chiseled into a platform in the bedrock. In front, on a lower level, he found several other cross holes. The cross hole extended 23 inches into solid bedrock, while the crack appeared to extend much deeper. Ron found coins in the building structure dating back to 135 AD and before, but none after. Ron and his two sons had worked here over a period of nearly two years. They used hammers and chisels and after a short time they could see an open space behind. They enlarged the hole so they could get through. While looking around, Ron found a chimney-like passage and from there a small tunnel where Ron had to exhale in order to squeeze himself through. He then noticed a stalactite about 16 inches long in front of the cliff wall. Behind it was a hole and Ron tried to look through it without any luck. So he enlarged it a little and could see a cave inside but it didn't look too promising and appeared to be a cave full of rocks. He enlarged a hole enough for his helper to crawl in, but he came quickly out again with a terrified look on his face, crying, what is in there? What is in there? I'm not going back in there. And then he tried to get out of the cave system as fast as he could. Now Ron realized that there might be something there and enlarged a hole enough for him to squeeze himself in. It was now January the 6th, 1982. There was about 18 inches of clearance between the rocks and the ceiling. Ron started shining his flashlight down through the rocks to see if there was anything underneath. He saw some dry rotten timbers and under it some dry rotten animal skins that turned into powder when he touched it. He then saw something reflecting back, something shiny and golden. At first he thought it could be the Ark of the Covenant, but when removing the animal's skin, he saw a gold venered table with a raised molding around the side, which consisted of an alternative pattern of a bell and a pomegranate. Ron felt sure this had to be from the first temple or the missing tabernacle furniture, and could be the original table of showbread. He then started to investigate the chamber more closely and looked around. He used his light and noticed a crack in the ceiling. Climbing closely to the rocks to the rear of the chamber, he saw a stone case right underneath the crack. It had a flat stone top which was cracked in two and a smaller section moved to the side creating an opening into the stone case. But the top was too close to the ceiling for him to be able to look inside it. He noticed a black substance in the crack above it and some more of the black substance on the edge of the lid leading into the box. The crack in the ceiling was directly above the cracked part of the lid where it was open and some of the black substance had to have fallen into the case. 
It was at this time, as Ron recalls, as the instant realization of what had happened here dawned on him that he passed out. When he realized that the crack in the ceiling was the end of the crack extending from the cross hole found in the elevated platform many feet above him and the black substance was blood that had fallen through the crack and into the stone case, he knew the Ark was in the stone case. But the most overwhelming realization was that Christ's blood had actually fallen on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Ron was passed out for some time. He later came back to the cave and managed to confirm that it really was the Ark of the Covenant. He informed the Israeli government of the discovery, but was told to keep it quiet. But Ron could not stay silent for long. Ron visited the chamber several times and reported that several items were in there in addition to the Ark of the Covenant in the stone case. The seven branch candlestick holder with their lamps from the original sanctuary, the golden altar of incense, the table of showbread, a golden censer, an ephod, a mitra with an ivory pomegranate on the tip, a brass shekel weight, oil lamps and a brass ring, and a very large sword. Ron had a laboratory in Israel analyze the blood remains he had found in the crack and on the mercy seat of the Ark. The result shocked them beyond anything. First of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling, all right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said, it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium. And keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under the microscope. And the one technician called the other one over there, and then they called the boss over there, and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit, and they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. Ron wanted to show everything to the world right away, but God stopped him.
On his fourth visit, the chamber and tunnel were all cleared up and the furniture arranged in their order. Ron instantly felt the presence of angels in the room, and he saw four angels, two standing on each side of the ark. They told him they were assigned to protect the ark, and then they told Ron to put his camera on a tripod and film. They lifted the mercy seat and helped him take out the Ten Commandments written on the two tables of stone. Ron then held them, showing them to the camera. They then told Ron when God had planned to show this to the world, at God's appointed time, when national Sunday laws are made at force shortly after that they will be shown to the world. Ron instantly knew what the angel meant as he had studied the topic beforehand. The angel was talking about the enforcement of the mark of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13 and 14 as the last deception and test coming over the world before Christ's second coming. Ron died in 1999 without seeing it fulfilled but he knew the evidence of what happened was on tape and he used his last months and years to tell people about the love of Christ, his sacrifice for us, and then he warned people of the coming mark of the beast law. And uh, I was told that these are to be presented with the blood evidence when the mark of the beast law is passed are in the worst literal than they ever imagined. One evening, Mary Nell Wyatt asked me to take a look at some material from a burial cave to see if these tiny particles were present. Without my knowledge, one of the samples was actually the blood sample that Ron had taken from the Ark of the Covenant dig. The sample was placed under the microscope and as the specimen began to come into focus, thousands of tiny particles summatids, if you will, became plainly visible. At that time, Mary Nell, who was standing behind me, began to weep. As I turned around and saw the expression on her face, I realized immediately that the sample we were looking at was actually the sample that Ron had found to be, the blood of Christ. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy fingers, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed.